thank you everyone for coming here. I uh, hope you will enjoy this talk. Um, I see first myself as an engineer. Uh, I hope uh, most of you uh, have finished some of the technical universities or you are still a student there. And the important thing is always to remember that uh, you are not just a software developer, you are also an engineer. So you should think uh, wider uh, than just a software developer. Uh, I'm also a hardware and emulation enthusiast. So, uh, yeah, as you saw, I, I worked on the uh, main project in the past. Uh, lately, I'm not that much involved, but I try to keep up with the other guys. Also, I've, uh, I'm working as a software developer since year 2000. And uh, right now, I'm a software architect and at Levi 9 Serbia. Uh, worked in the various languages in the past, but uh, it's important uh, for you also to know that it's, it's really good to switch between the languages uh, in your career uh, so you just can find what fits you the best. And what always fits me the best was the C and C++, so I stayed there. Uh, yeah, as I said, I was working on the main emulation project, and we will see that it's kind of important for this talk. Uh, so, why we are here? Well, thing is uh, understanding hardware and why that is important. Well, for me, to be a better developer, you need to know uh, and understand your uh, computer, how your computer works, and to understand the hardware beneath. Uh, and bet best way to do that is actually uh, to make it work, you know, to make something and to see how it works. And you can say, okay, well, I'm just a software developer, I don't understand electronics and so on. Well, you know, we can make you, you know, write hardware as a source code and then compile to the actual hardware. And I will show you how. Well, you can say always, you know, it's impossible, too hard, but those are just lame excuses and we have just what, one hour and a half and to, to do that actually. So, and overall, we are here just to have some fun, and I hope you will uh, have some fun uh, with me together to, to see how it works. So, let's start. And we first, uh, because I uh, talked that uh, there is actually no en enter limit uh, for this uh, topic, so we will just remind ourselves everything you have probably learned at university, but, you know, just to have the common things that we can talk about. So let's start with the Boolean logic. And as you know, we always have ones and zeros. And that's, that's how you see it, uh, basically, and that's what you have learned in the past. But uh, what is the ele electronic representation of one and zero? Well, that depends on the technology you're actually using. So it could be that I it's uh, just a voltage level, that's a higher voltage level for one, and lower voltage level for zero. But right now, in, in, in current hardware, you have a multiple uh, levels of the uh, logic. So, so, so basically, you can have, a, for example, 5 volts, which is kind of old right now. You have 3.3 uh, that's used, and 1.8. And so those levels are not always the same. So you sometimes need to, do, to have additional logic that will help you to, to uh, level up those uh, voltage levels. And uh, there is something new. Uh, there is X. Uh, X uh, represents uh, the state which is undefined. And that's kind of important uh, in uh, hardware design because you can actually optimize. Because in some cases, you just don't care uh, what's the value. Is it 1 or 0? In some cases, you don't care, so you put X. And then you can uh, your optimizer can help you uh, get a better and smaller logic to do the same job. Uh, but there is also something new that's called Z, that's uh, high dependence. Uh, that one is quite important uh, in cases uh, like you probably learned that uh, on the computers you have buses. So you have bus for address bus, you have the data bus, uh, but there are multiple uh, devices that are trying to access that bus. Uh, then you use the high impedance uh, to make it, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to separate uh, those devices, so only one can have actual data, uh, but the others are having the high impedance or a Z, 
uh, which can, you know, you, you can learn much more about uh, electronics behind that. Uh, it, it's out of scope for, for this talk because we will not have enough time. So uh, let's remind ourselves also about the Boolean operations. So we have and, or, so, or, not, and, nor, snor, and we have this simple you know, logic. I, I, it's kind of a, a thing that you have probably seen uh, while you're even in, in the high school, uh, you're doing the Boolean logic. So it's, it's nothing important, but just to uh, remind ourselves. One important uh, other thing is D flip-flop. D flip-flop uh, is, is a simple uh, memory unit. So it basically represents one bit of memory. And we see here uh, that you have a, a D, which is data. You have a Q, which is output. You have a not Q as well. And you have a clock. So uh, you we will learn now uh, two more uh, interesting things. And those are the rising edge and falling edge. Uh, rising, uh, most of the uh, in the hardware design, uh, most reactions are actually on the on the rising edge. So everything you do, you you basically react on rising edge, and that is the shifting level from zero to one. And we can see that uh, in this case, uh, on the rising edge, uh, data is actually stored on the output only on the rising edge. You can see that in the in the table. And if uh, on the uh, we also have the R and S uh, inputs as an optional, and those are just for resetting and setting uh, the memory. Uh, why are these, you know, all uh, things that we have just reminded ourselves important? Well, uh, these are important because uh, they are ex essential parts of any electronic circuits, but uh, also the essential part of uh, FPGA. So what is actually FPGA? Uh, FPGA is the Field Programmable Gate Array. I mean, the main uh, name doesn't tell you much, but the uh, thing is that uh, it's uh, Field Programmable part means that uh, it's empty uh, as, uh, by default, it's empty. And it's, uh, y you can basically uh, program uh, what that hardware do uh, manually on the field. So, uh, and I will show you how. Uh, thing is that you have, uh, it contains uh, of a logic blocks. Uh, we can see it, for example, like this orange boxes. And uh, those orange boxes uh, representing uh, lookup tables, D flip flops, and full letters. We will go in the details afterwards. Uh, it also uh, contains IO blocks. Uh, IO blocks are the parts uh, that are actually connected to the each pin of the FPGA. So FPGA, you can see FPGA as a, uh, as a chip, uh, which have a, uh, each pin connected to the IO block. And then uh, we have interconnection, uh, which connects those IO pins and those logic blocks in between. Uh, there are also uh, so-called hard blocks. And those have additional you know, meaning, so, so you can uh, have a block RAM, you can have a multipliers, you can have a DSP, even CPUs inside. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in lately, it's quite common uh, to have a ARM7 CPU inside the FPGA, uh, so they can interconnect and you can have uh, a, much, a much more powerful device. Uh, there are various uh, vendors that produces the uh, FPGAs, like uh, Xilinx, uh, uh, Intel, it was Altera before, uh, Lattice, mic Microsemi, and, and more. Uh, but uh, you know, the thing is that uh, they all have their own technologies, so those are quite different inside and can, ha can have uh, multiple different uh, uh, parts. Uh, so, so some have uh, additional CPU, some have more memory, some have uh, the lot of loads, and, and so on. Uh, and the uh, important thing about uh, FPGA is, okay, uh, so you can ask, where could I use that? You know, what's the purpose of them? Well, the uh, initial idea was actually to create prototypes. And uh, in, uh, the FPGAs became uh, available about uh, middle of 80s. Uh, and that was the period, if you remember, of the uh, 
computer uh, boom, basically. You had a lot of computers from various manufacturers, and uh, most of those manufacturers were actually companies that were already selling some kind of electronics. So they used their all off-the-shelf components to make something new. Uh, but the thing was that there were some parts which were too complicated, you know, and the production of the ASIC chips is, is really, really expensive and still is. And uh, if you like to make a prototype, it's better to use the FPGA to create something. And then after that, you use that as a starting point to the uh, creation of the ASIC chip. You will have uh, with FPGA a lower performance, but you will still uh, see uh, how it's actually functioning or does it function. Okay, so uh, let's move to the logic blocks. Uh, if you can see here, uh, you have some uh, inputs and you have the output, uh, and the inputs go directly to the lookup table. Uh, you can see a lookup table as a simple memory. Uh, so you have a, a three bit address bus, and you have the two outputs, for example. Uh, there are various different, uh, depends on the, uh, of the vendor. Basically, you can have three up to six inputs and one up to two outputs and those outputs can go to the full header uh, you can then uh, go to the uh, d flip flop uh, which is uh, a memory part and thing is that with uh, with muxes you are actually uh, those are multiplexers sorry and uh, you can actually connect output directly to the flip flop or you can connect it outside uh, uh, so so you can use uh, each part or not use each of those parts uh, inside one uh, a logic block. Uh, that makes uh, this device basically to have a lot of logic blocks uh, that are configurable fully. So you can, uh, you always use, uh, uh, each part is the same. You have just uh, these uh, uh, clock trees and you have connections. So basically when you, uh, when you power it up, you program those and you, uh, you have different functionality uh, going out of, of each of these blocks. So the question is now, how do we program FPGAs after all? So uh, there is uh, something uh, called HDL. So it's a hardware description language. Uh, it's a bit different uh, than you have in the software uh, languages and uh, two that are most uh, important for us and that are mostly available are VHDL and Verilog. Uh, VHDL is, uh, well, it could be easy for those of you ha who have uh, learned ADA, and I guess <laughs> there is not much of you who have <laughs> even tried that language, uh, but it's, it's basically uh, a language that is constructed uh, for the Department of Defense of the United States uh, as a requirement for uh, constructing the hardware in the 70s. So that is before FPGAs came, uh, but it's still used uh, especially to design ASICs. And it's quite robust language, uh, but it's not that easy to understand uh, like Verilog is. And Verilog came uh, also uh, in the mid-80s, so in the time when the uh, uh, FPGAs came, and it's more like a C syntax, and we will see that yeah. soon. So uh, we have a few processes, basically, uh, when we are trying to, to create uh, 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 su such a program for in, in HDL. So we have uh, something called analysis, and that is actually a parsing and validation of our HDL code. Uh, so it could be uh, something, uh, you can say it's a preprocessor for the uh, language, like you have for C or C++, you have a preprocessor. Uh, we have a sy uh, synthesis tool. Uh, that's basically a compiler. Uh, so you're compiling HDL to the netlist. Uh, we have a place and route. Uh, place and route uh, is basically uh, you saw the, those uh, logic blocks. So you have a lot of logic blocks. Uh, you convert uh, your so uh, source code uh, to something like uh, logic elements, uh, but then you need to know uh, which of those logic blocks in your FPGA will have which functionality. So you then basically place and connect them. So you place them and then route uh, connections between them. 
uh, and it basically uh, gives you something which is specific for that FPGA technology. So it depends pretty much of the vendor. And we have something called assembler, uh, which basically converts uh, that uh, code that we get to the bit stream. And the bit stream is basically binary code uh, that will go into a flash memory uh, that you will put basically on the board, on the same board as FPGA. I mean, I'm now talking about real hardware. So, so uh, the uh, on uh, when you power on the FPGA, it will automatically uh, start uh, loading data from that uh, uh, flash memory and and fill uh, his his in internal memory, and will then reboot and basically start to up uh, to work as that hardware. And uh, for uh, as a last step, we have a programming, so it's actually deploying Bitstream on on device. So we are programming that serial flash memory directly, or or we are going uh, to to directly access the memory of inside the FPGA. Uh, there is ad additional steps that we can uh, use. Uh, those uh, those are timing analysis, and also simulation because uh, the actual hardware can be quite expensive and some things could be dangerous to try, so you would like first to try if it works in simulation. So these were all uh, the things that are you know, usual for, for each. It's just for you to get the idea uh, how it is compared to the programming languages. Uh, we will use here the open source tools for this project. So we have Yosis, it's a Verilog synthesis tool by Clifford Wolf. He's a great guy and he's also a software developer. Uh, he is not a hardware guy and it, it proves that uh, you know, uh, even uh, the, the guys that are doing the hardware, they say, oh, it, it, it's impossible to make uh, a Verilog synthesis tool. They were talking that for years and he was the software guy who actually made it, you know, because you know, the, the, the hardware guy sees you know things differently so so you, 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 you i mean they they always tell you uh, this is hard this is hard but it's more you know like don't touch our stuff <laughs> you know that basically that's it and uh there is also arachne pnr this is, uh, that we will use it's a place in raho tool uh project Artstorm. Uh, basically what they figured out is that they reverse engineered uh the bitstream for one of the lattices uh, FPGAs. It's a simple uh, FPGA, basically. It has only 1K of, uh, of uh, logic elements, uh, but it's good enough for us to, to, show to do some demos and to do some, some simple things. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it works only on that uh, uh, Lattice IC40 FPGAs. But we also have the Icarus Verilog, uh, which will help us to do the simulation. And I'm, I will use uh, Verilator. Uh, that is a really interesting tool. Uh, it basically allows you to convert Verilog code to C++ classes. And I will show you now how you can use afterwards C++ tools to actually uh, unit test your uh, software, your hardware <laughs> in this case. Uh, and we have more. Uh, there are a lot of more uh, of tools for the uh, FPGAs that uh, came uh, in last year. Uh, there is APO, which is basically completely uh, complete build system, microsystem for the, uh, and basically it uses the packages. Uh, so I it's um, more for uh, uh, beginners uh, to have an easy start with FPGAs. Also, there is a few SOC. Uh, it's uh, basically package manager, but it also gives you ability uh, to have a unique build script, something like CMake, for example, uh, and uh, you can build for each of the vendor div uh, vendor tools. So you can say, okay, build me this for Intel tools, and build me this for the uh, for the Lattice tools. So so you can have a, a uh, similar like you are using different compilers for the different CPUs. And also there is a uh, iStudio. iStudio is a great uh, graphics editor and it enables you to define your FPGA blocks uh, by uh, just uh, you know using the graphical elements and connecting the wires basically. And we will uh, see that later. 
So uh, let's get started with our project. So what computers uh, consists of? Well, we have CPU, okay, and CPU uh, cr uh, have uh, registers, it have arithmetical logical unit, it have control unit, so you all learned that. We also have memory, and we also have then some I.O. devices. And now the important thing, how do we name our project? Because if you don't have a name, you know, it's hard to start. <laughs> Actually, then you need to rename everything in the, in the future. So I was thinking, and I, okay, it must be simple. Well, this is not that lightning fast, you know. We will make some simple hardware that is not fast. Okay, but, you know, uh, because it's not lightning fast, it's, it's thunder, basically. So, and the Polish word for thunder is Grom, right? So, and this will be the 8-bit CPU, so we'll call it Grom 8. Uh, I think it, it fits. <laughs> so, uh, I'll go let's go to the architecture. Ah, okay, we said it's 8-bit it's CPU. It, ha it will have gen uh, four general purpose registers. Uh, we will have a uh, 12 bit uh, uh, address bus and program counter, basically. We will have, uh, because uh, we will have 8 uh, bit registers, so in order to address our memory, we will also need a code segment and data segment. And this is, if you worked with the uh, Intel CPUs, they also have that for to, to uh, So we will use those two as well. We will have a stack pointer, of course, and we will have a 8-bit arithmetical logical unit. We will use just three of those flags. So this is just a, you know, uh, uh, it will be by uh, von Neumann architecture. So I can I can show you if you want to do a hardware architecture, it's a could be a could be done just with a little changes. But yeah, this is basically a CPU on the level of 80s, let's say. And here is some kind of instruction set <laughs> that I plan to use. So we have the instructions for moving, addition. So you have uh, those after for uh, that are coming from Alu, and you have uh, also for working with the stack, for working with the memory. Uh, you have the halt instruction. Uh, also, you have jump, conditional jumps. Uh, there is input output. So it's it's a regular uh, architecture for some 8-bit CPU. Uh, as you see, uh, there are question marks on some parts. Uh, that means that those are empty, and you can uh, later take that code, add your new features, and have something new uh, added to this CPU core. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, Verilog. Uh, as I said, Verilog is is uh, really simple language and it basically if you ever work uh, with the C or C like languages uh, then uh, most of the things will be just natural to you so uh, we will start with uh, doing the memory block because it's it's the simple one so uh, in the Verilog uh, we have something called modules uh, you can see that as a um, uh, function in C or, or a method in Java or C++. So you have, uh, uh, each method have its name, and uh, at the end module, basically that's everything between, uh, it's, uh, it's one, uh, one module. And uh, you can see it also as a building block. So you can uh, use those blocks basically to build something bigger. Uh, also, uh, each of the blocks have, of course, uh, its inputs and outputs. And you can see here how they're defined. Uh, it's important thing that uh, to, to notice that first here you have a, a clock. Uh, in all uh, hardware design, you always have, a, um, everything is led by the clock. So, so you, uh, you will see uh, how it's used and because it's, it's basically synchronized uh, by that clock signal. And uh, you can uh, also see here that you have, for example, address is, is basically 11 uh, double, uh, double column uh, zero. That means that it's a 12-bit uh, address given. So you have, I mean, I it's quite natural, uh, but uh, from the type perspective, 
you're basically having uh, just uh, wires in this case, or registers like uh, for the output. I will explain uh, tho tho those things in details after, but uh, here just it's important that we figure out that we have uh, inputs and outputs defined in the in the beginning. Uh, we also uh, have something called registers. Uh, this register, for example, you can see it's uh, four kilobytes actually because it's wide, eight bit wide, but it's uh, it's four kilo uh, uh, k uh, long. So uh, this basically represents uh, a RAM memory uh, storage. Uh, thing that is important here is that uh, in this case, tools will recognize that it's a large amount and it will try to put that in the memory dedicated blocks. So we will use the block RAM. And this device uh, that I'm using have uh, 64 kilobits of memory. Uh, so not kilobytes, but kilobits. Uh, and that is 8 kilobytes. Uh, so, so it can perfectly fit uh, this and we have even enough more room. Uh, next thing here is the initial block. So basically, if you have a module that need to initialize somehow on the boot uh, part, uh, you can use these initial blocks. And you see here that uh, we are using basically some uh, call that will actually uh, load file, which is called boot.mem, and it will uh, access uh, the store. So it will basically load some predefined memory content into RAM. Uh, uh, please note that uh, on FPGA, because everything is done dynamically, so it's loaded at the beginning, everything is basically RAM. So uh, in order to make something uh, uh, read-only, you basically need to cut it off when, when you try to read it. So it's always, uh, I mean, it's always treated as a, as a RAM memory. Uh, next one is always block. Uh, so uh, always block is one of the most important things uh, because you have, uh, if you see at the beginning, you have always at, so it means at uh, a change of some signal. And in this case is a change of a positive edge of the clock. So we will always synchronize reading and writing to memory on positive edge. And it's a good uh, uh, hardware design thing to uh, always to react on the clock and not on the inputs only, uh, because if you start um, reacting on input, then you are actually not using that um, uh, clock tree that I was talking about. So, so each of those uh, blocks is getting the data from the block tree, but if you need to, uh, to propagate any other signal you know, you would need to l lose a lot of connections, basically, and you will spend uh, much more uh, of FPGA blocks uh, by uh, making uh, your logic depending on the on the different uh, inputs. And in in more most cases, you just need to to react on the on the clock. So D flip flops are basically only reacting on the flops. And here we will have also the uh, conditional check. So you have if. So it's exactly same like in every other language. So you have just a check uh, here I because it's a, it's a bit, so it's always is it set or not, but you can also use the other uh, greater than, less than, or so on. And, and here uh, you can see that it's, it's basically not blocking assignment. And why this is important? Uh, uh, you can see it's not uh, equal sign, but it's assignment sign. Uh, that means that the uh, that storage, for example, in first case, will get that data in, uh, but in the next clock. So basically, you are preparing. You need to think in parallel. Uh, we will come to this now. So uh, it's a parallel execution. Is the thing that is distinguishing between the software development and the hardware development on the hardware everything happens in the same time. So if you're, for example, um, if you have a software product and you add some uh, debugging, you know, you add some if blocks, checks, you know, just to display something, uh, that can take a lot of CPU time. So you can uh, change basically uh, speed of your 
code just by adding some debugging, logging, and you can get uh, wrong results. Uh, in hardware, if you do it right, uh, it just doesn't affect your output. So it's, it's completely separate hardware. You know, you, you, you don't have, it, it, it happens in parallel anyway. But uh, here what is important is that, for example, if you uh, see the first example, you will see that address is getting program counter. Program counter is incremented by one. But it's completely same if we do the program counter is assigned with program counter plus one and then address because those uh, are executed in parallel. So uh, that will become active on the next transition. You know, and if uh, you can also use the blocking uh, assignment, and in if you do the blocking assignment, then it's not the same. So you need to take uh, really good precautions about this, and and it, it really depends what you are actually trying to achieve. Uh, and I I think this is the the, the most uh, I mean the biggest problem for each software developer just you know to always keep this in mind. Otherwise, you will get the strange result. For you, everything looks good, but it's not working as you expected. Uh, one of the next uh, block it's uh, for the I/O devices. So uh, it's a good example that we can, you know, show that uh, if there are multiple things that you need to to do or check, you can always put it in the begin end block. So uh, in case you have more than one line, you know. Uh, that you need to do, you put it in the begin end block, or y if you're not sure, you, you know. So, so it's basically like open bracket, close bracket, in 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 C and C plus plus, or or begin end in the Pascal, or things like that. You also have a case. Uh, so in this case, you can see here that uh, what is important on the on this image is uh, also the representation of numbers. Uh, you can see, for example, that out register is initially initialized to the 7-bit uh, output with all zeros. So it, that's how you define the binary. And you also have here, uh, in the case, you can basically, depending on the value, because it's a 4-bit, it's you can actually uh, check all the cases. Uh, there are even uh, two uh, special cases, uh, which is case X and case Z, Z uh, which basically enables you to react on the undefined or uh, high impedance as well. So, so then you can also include those uh, into your calculation, so sometimes you get the better results and optimize better. Uh, you can also notice on the, on the bottom now that there is a continuous assignment. Uh, continuous assignment is uh, uh, specially uh, create because you do not wish, I mean, you just want to wire up some things and they are always like that. So, so you are using those continuous assignment. That means that the O segment A, uh, which is the uh, one of the outputs, will get always the data from output registers. So you are basically connecting that wire. In th that's the hardware representation, basically, in this case. So let's go to the arithmetic or logical unit. This is now, you know, we are going just uh, from those simple things to the a bit complicated ones. Uh, so in this case, we have the local parameters. Uh, you can use it as, as a constant. Basically, it's, it's like uh, in C, you use define, for example, or just const value. And you can assign a, a specific value. It's just easier for you afterwards to use the, the names instead of the values because sometimes it, it comes really, really hard to, 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 to match all of those uh, in your code if you don't have this. So uh, we have here this blocking assignment. Uh, and uh, for example, I will show you why. It's because uh, here we have the register, uh, which is temporary. And we are basically doing a uh, blocking assignment so we can later in the same clock use that same assignment, uh, same values that we, uh, we just calculated. So uh, we have here the simple uh, operations that will uh, be uh, done by our uh, arithmetical logical unit. So we have assignment, we have subtraction, 
we have assignment with carry flag and we have a uh, subtraction with carry flag. Uh, important thing is that uh, with the carry flag operations you can extend. So you can basically uh, always, uh, you have just 8-bit ALU, but you can use it for a 16-bit, 24-bit, whatever, you know, size, because you can just uh, connect multiple of those and you will get the proper result in, in your calculation. So you, you see that the, the operations, uh, since A and B are uh, in this case 8 bit, eight bit inputs, uh, you will get a 9 bit output. Uh, why is that? Well, the uh, thing is that uh, when you uh, add two 8 bit numbers, uh, you can get a carry flag, and that carry flag goes on the top. So uh, here uh, we also have, uh, for example, the bitwise operations, and those are uh, uh, those will always give you the uh, eight-bit output because uh, they are not uh, oper uh, operating with uh, with that additional bit. So we will put that one always on on a zero, and you see the the, the same uh, operations are basically used like like you have it on the C or or Java or any other language basically used. And for example, for these shift operations, well, uh, shift operations are, are, are I mean, simple, uh, and basically most of those are just used uh, to get something more like multiplication. So if you are shifting, you know, you can multiply, or uh, if you are shifting on the other side, you are basically dividing by two. So uh, here uh, we can see how the uh, uh, the uh, the values are basically shifting through the register. Uh, and also for the rotation, uh, it's, it's similar to the shifting, uh, but in this case, uh, we are basically making them uh, just exchange uh, their, uh, uh, their positions, so they're not going in uh, void, but they are going to the proper place in the beginning. And the most important thing for this block is actually at the end, and that is uh, how we set the flags. So you remember we put the uh, when we added two numbers, uh, uh, we basically uh, have the result is uh, you can see uh, on the bottom line uh, those are just eight numbers. So uh, when we uh, add two eight eight bit numbers, we have we have eight bit output, but also we have a carry flag, which is on the top bit. So it's bit number eight is basically a carry flag. And if we wish to check if it's uh, if it's zero, we will check just the, the if result is actually a zero. And sign flag is basically the top bit of the result, so it's seventh bit. And then you you know if it's uh, a positive or negative number, so you can use that in your calculations. So that, that that's how the the uh, the uh, CPU actually works. I mean I it's it's basically quite simple. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's j just a thing for you to, to remember from the uh, university and things that you probably have learned there. Uh, so we have also other operations, like multiplication. Uh, in this case, uh, when you multiply two 8-bit number, uh, you will get uh, a 16-bit number, actually, as a maximum. So also, uh, if you have uh, division, uh, of two numbers, uh, you can get, uh, in this case, also an eight-bit number, but uh, then you need to, uh, for the modulus, you use the other logic. Uh, in this case, concrete, uh, this uh, device does not have uh, multiplication blocks uh, as a hardware one. Uh, so it takes a lot of uh, logical units uh, to create a specially division uh, part, and basically then uh, we will spend more than we have on this FPGA, which is small one, uh, to add uh, these two functionalities, so I didn't add them there. But you can always use this trick, so you can always multiply by two, divide by two. Uh, the old CPUs like uh, Z80 or 6502, uh, they didn't have multiplication and division at all. They always use the shifting, basically, and you do it in your software. So let's move uh, to the CPU. So uh, what's important uh, is that uh, for the CPU, we, we need to define the registers 
and you see those program counter, you have instruction register, you have stack pointer, general purpose registers, so you have array of registers, which is basically uh, uh, those are from zero to three, those will be the general purpose. And we have some internal registers here for the ALU, and you, you see those wires. Uh, wires are things that are basically just used to interconnect uh, things uh, between the modules. And uh, that's, that is how you use the module. Uh, you basically instantiate it, uh, give it some name, and then you connect uh, first that dot sil uh, silk, uh, silk is, is, is basically clock signal uh, that's defined in ALU. And uh, the, the other signal uh, in between the brackets is basically our signal. So we can connect, for example, here a uh, is, is the input of ALU, and we, we put the register from our CPU. So this is how you actually just interconnect between two modules. This is the uh, instantiation of it. Uh, and uh, what is important for a CPU is that CPU is actually a state machine. I mean, uh, if you uh, have looked at the older CPUs, you can see, I mean, every CPU have basically multiple um, cl uh, clock cycles that are needed for some operations. And there is a reason for it. Uh, we will start here with the simple thing. And the um, simple thing is actually resetting of a CPU. And what happens is that uh, you always react. So in the always block, you always react just on the clock. And then I and if in the clock phase I get the signal from the reset, si uh, reset uh, line, I will uh, uh, just change the my state in whichever I was before, I don't care. I will change it to the state reset. And uh, in the state reset after, in the next clock, basically I, I will put uh, these values. So I will put program counter to zero. I can reset all of the, uh, the values of the registers. And, and then I go to the uh, fetch preparation. So I go to the next, to reading the, the new uh, new instruction. Uh, what is usually done in the CPUs is that you only set the program counter. You don't care about the rest. So it's always undefined behavior, you know. So that's why in the uh, most CPUs, first thing you do, you clear the registers, you, uh, I don't know, disable the, the interrupts if you want to, to be sure that nobody is uh, you know, will change your state. So th those are the things that are, you know, important when you are doing the assembly language, actually programming. Uh, for the instruction uh, fetching, uh, uh, because we are doing the uh, synced, uh, we are using the memory which, uh, which uh, needs a, a synchronization over the clock, we need some additional, uh, one additional more step because we need first to prepare uh, to the address bus, we prepare the program counter. We said, okay, write enable to zero, so we want to read. Uh, I.O. request to zero, because we don't want uh, I.O. request, but we want a memory request. And then we wait a bit, you know, just one clock, and then go directly uh, to the fetch phase, in which we will take the data from memory and put it into instruction register and increment the uh, program counter, and then we can leave to the execution. Uh, this uh, fetch weight we also can use to check for the half status, and half status is just a flag that we can rise to block our CPU. We just want it to stop on that and stop execution, so it always loop on on one uh, one instruction. And uh, how we do the uh, instruction decoding? Well, uh, you have seen that uh, big list of, of all instructions. And what I did there is that uh, I have split basically into two uh, kind of the instructions. So we have uh, a top bit will distinguish if we are using uh, two bytes instructions or one byte instructions. So first block here covers the uh, two byte instructions. That means that we need again, to go and fetch another byte, you know, to get 
two bytes that we can then decode actually. And the uh, here uh, down there you can see that, uh, for example, for a simple operation like um, move instruction, uh, we can uh, in in this switch case basically we are doing uh, we are decoding and right away we are executing the uh, uh, assignment from one register to another register. And if you can see, uh, if you do the move R0, R0, you will get basically no operation. So it's a NOP. And it's a good practice for you to keep a zero, 00 code as a NOP. You know, you always have an no operation and you can use it for to make some delays because you know exactly how much it will take you know and uh, this is the uh, conditional compiling part so uh, in case i do the simulation i would like to see uh, what are the outputs you know did i get the proper output so di did i decode the operation correctly so you can use that uh, as well in your code and uh, here is the part when we are actually using the arithmetical logical unit. So how we do it? We just, you know, prepare result, uh, prepare uh, inputs in in uh, in a temporary registers, uh, and we uh, set the value up uh, that is also the uh, temporary register of a CPU. So uh, and we just change the state, and because we already wired up in the next clock cycle, uh, our ALU model will give us outputs exactly what we want, you know. So in case uh, when we reach the ALU result, we will basically, in that register, we will have the uh, proper value. So that, that's how you actually use that block. I mean, it's not that simple, <laughs> but it's doable, I mean. Uh, and if you wish to do the memory operation, you also have that you can also manually prepare the address bus, set the the uh, right enable to zero or to one in case you are storing. I mean, you can see that basically uh, load and store are basically the same. It's just that load takes more time because uh, you need to synchronize again with the memory and in the next uh, cycle just to read the value to the proper result register. And for the store, you're just preparing that data and you can go straightly to fetch because it will be enough time for, for the memory to, to take that output and to put it in the proper place. And tho these are the, uh, the actual load value. So uh, we need to make overall computer now. And to do that, uh, we need to wire everything up. So we have the ground computer, which have all of these inputs as defined. So we will just have the clock reset and we will have the output, halt output, just to be able to display uh, a, a little LED, you know, to, to have the status. And you have the display out, which will be the our output device. So we want to show some number, for example, there. And here we, uh, we, we do the, the vi internal wiring. So we instantiate CPU, we instantiate memory. We said, OK, memory is enabled when I do uh, have the write enable, you know, and I'm not doing the IO requests. So, so then I'm actually doing the that operation. A and here uh, at the bottom, you can see that we have the always block, which is just uh, doing the uh, in case of any access to the IO device, we will always uh, use that display output. So we don't care which address is on, we will output on any address and it will show us on the display. You can do, of course, this on a much easier way. Uh, a tool that I mentioned is iStudio, and you can do this visually. So you have a blocks. You know, I created a block for a Grom CPU. I created a block in which you can type the source. This is the hardware for the for the uh, seven segment displays and then you can see basically how the connections are wired so this is the actual hardware uh, that you can uh, you can uh, create by your own but of course uh, important thing is let's simulate all of this just to see if it's if it's working as we expected and uh, I use this simple program 
Uh, here I put the data segment to two. I load some memory, you know. I increment that twice. I store that memory. Output that value. Then I increment again, and then I, you know, uh, call uh, the subroutine to again. I mean, this was just an exercise to show that uh, we have the stack operations as well. Uh, I mean, uh, also that there is a halt operation that you can, you know, uh, have the output, the the, the ALU is working, and so on. So this is the test bench. Uh, test benches are actually a uh, way how you simulate your code. And as you see, it's also a Verilog. Uh, you have their time scale. Time scale is just uh, to define uh, which is the, uh, basically, uh, those numbers that you will use after the hash sign uh, will represent time. But you need to represent in which unit you define at the top of the document. So we will use the nanoseconds, basically, here. So I can say, for example, here, always on each five, uh, just uh, exchange the clock. So uh, uh, basically, it will make us uh, to, to have each 10 nanoseconds, you will have a full clock. A and then you can basically test with that. And here, what we uh, did, I said, OK, dump everything to the VCD file of this test bench, and first reset then put the reset on zero and just work some time and then finish, nothing else. And the output of that simulation can be seen in, in, in here. So we are basically executing that code so we can see that the address bus is changing from uh, zero and, and you can see basically the program counter as well down there and you can see the registers uh, you can see the memory, what's output on the memory. Uh, you can see the reset. Also, the clock is always on the top. So, so you can actually see the signals, so you can debug and see if everything fits your idea. I mean, it's a bit, a little bit complicated if you have never worked with the hardware, uh, but uh, sometimes, in most cases, you can actually find uh, design issues on this level. So after that, uh, uh, you can, for example, run the simulation here, and because I have enabled the uh, uh, that variable, so I can see, I can do the debug, I can see which are the uh, instructions and what is the current state of all registers, and uh, what are the states of the uh, of the ALU uh, flags. So basically, you can see here how the code is executing. What is displaying on the output? Where it's jumping, you know? And also, what's displaying again? So you can just run and, and see how it's actually executing. And uh, this is all before we are actually get to the proper uh, hardware. But one thing that actually is not done by the hardware developers, but what we do as a software developer is unit testing. So you would like to somehow unit test your code, but this is not code, you know, this is the hardware stuff. So, but there is a way uh, to do it. And the way to do it is basically to use that variolator. A and you can, uh, I use the catch as a, as a C, uh, for C++, which is a, a testing framework. And you can just configure here that I si uh, start the variolator here, and then in the test case, I use, OK, I will just go around. Oh, I will initialize my hardware because uh, it will be translated, you know, Verilog file will be translated to the C++ class. I will set all the data as I wish here. And then I will execute all uh, uh, numbers. I mean, I will uh, use all the 8-bit inputs for A and B. And we'll check, did I get the proper result uh, there. So, so basically that's uh, how you can actually unit test and that is how I found uh, a few issues with the code where, where the flags were not correctly set actually due to a, a really stupid mistake. But let's go to the real hardware. When you wish to connect to the real hardware uh, you also need to, I mean, uh, you again create a so-called top model and the top model can only have inputs and outputs 
that are actually representing pins on your FPGA. And in this case, you can have uh, you can give them the uh, names that you wish, actually. But uh, then you do the same wiring as you would do for any other module. But you also need this board definition file, and the board definition file uh, uh, is the one that contains the uh, which uh, this is basically name, and then you have a number which represents the pin on actual. Uh, FPGA device. So, uh, in case you are using some development boards, you uh, you would get this uh, this file uh, from the vendor, and then you can just reuse it. You know, and if you are making your own, then you are actually deciding which pin will be used for what purpose. But usually, clock uh, is uh, strictly defined. And here uh, we are going to use this uh, Go board. I think this is using the most simple FPGAs that's available, and it only have uh, 1K of gates, uh, and th this one have a four switches, you have a USB which is used for powering it, and also uh, can be used for programming, you have a VGA port, uh, uh, you have a two seg seven segment displays that we will utilize, you have some LEDs, and you have a P-Mod which is for extension. So let's do some live demo, and I will just uh, power on uh, this FPGA, and you can basically see uh, that this is the uh, this is the code that was actually in the example, and what I have uh, assigned is that this button here is a reset button. And you can see uh, it depends uh, how fast I click, actually, because uh, when you click the button, you don't have just one signal. You know, you have the multiple signals, and it depends if it's uh, you know uh, if it's uh, proper. So so you you can have uh, multiple changes on on your uh, on on these numbers. So basically, it can go, you know, by two. Sometimes it goes more. <laughs> you know, depending of. So what I did is actually uh, I'm. Uh, using the undefined behavior of this CPU, uh, so uh, memory is actually not cleared on the reset. I mean, that's the regular stuff. Uh, it's not a hard reset, it's a soft reset in this case. So uh, what I'm doing is that uh, on each uh, reset, I'm actually executing my program from the beginning, and then uh, after that, it will first read the data from the memory, which was initially zero, but after that, uh, I, I have written that uh, uh, result of incrementation to the memory. So when I read it back, it will be 2 in the next case, and then 4 in the next case, so and so on. And if I, uh, depending on how I click, I, I can give multiple signals. So sometimes it can go from 2 to 10, you know, because it, it, it can ha fast, uh, count fast. So this is basically the end of the presentation. but you have uh, more information and the full source code is available. Uh, you can also use the Nandland uh, YouTube video channel, uh, which can enable you to see uh, some of these things in more details, because the one hour is you know, not that much time to, to explain all the things that are related to the FPGAs. And you also have here some other links for the Clifford tool for Yosis. Uh, and uh, for the FPGA for students, which uh, gives you the uh, more uh, simple example how you can start actually to uh, work with the FPGAs. So we can, I think, move for questions. Hey, Martin, do we have any questions on the app? No, okay, so we will take question live, so please. Uh, do we have microphone? Thank you for a nice talk. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, the question is simple. How many gates uh, did this uh, Grom 8 CPU yeah. take? Uh, it was uh, about, uh, I think, 900 gates. 
uh, uh, sorry, 800, 800 gates uh, was involved. And when I do the timing analysis, uh, it could run uh, about 80 uh, megahertz. Uh, okay. So I, it have a ability to run on this hardware about uh, at 80, uh, 80 megahertz. So it's not that slow. <laughs> I mean, but it uh, took almost entire uh, FPGA. Uh, yeah, yeah, because this is the the smallest one. Uh, this is the smallest one available. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and the, uh, uh, j j just to give you the the uh, you know size comparison. So uh, these kind of boards uh, with this one K of gates. Uh, it's up to f uh, about fifty dollars, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, if you uh, use eight K uh, gates, uh, that's uh, th that's available even for sixty, seventy, something like that. And when you go more, you know, uh, for example, you can have uh, in the uh, um, I don't know. If, uh, I have one for uh, it's about fifty thousand gates, and it's about two hundred euros. You know, but you, uh, the prices are going up and up. Uh, so, so if you really need uh, something like uh, millions of gates, that's thousands of dollars <laughs> in the euro. So it, it, it became uh, quite big. But development boards also, uh, this, kind, uh, this, this one is simple, but you can have a lot of hardware uh, there. And also they have those P mods or additional things. So you can basically uh, connect any other hardware. So you can connect USB, you can connect cam camera, you can uh, connect HDMI. And then, uh, but please note, uh, this VGA, you have it here, but you need to create video signal. So you need to create a uh, sync signal. You, can, uh, you need to create a clock signal for the video. And all the uh, RGB parts, you, you need to create them. It, it, it's, uh, it's not just dry li uh, draw a line, you know. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. More Any questions? other questions? In the back. Uh, I want to ask a question uh, because you mentioned about open source tools, which is great because actually this was the question I was about to ask even before I uh, arrived uh, to your talk. Yes. Um, but uh, can you compare also uh, the, um, um, say, so to say, enterprise tools, mm -hmm. uh, the paid tools uh, for the FPGAs to the open source? Because yeah. uh, when you uh, explain the stages uh, of processing, there actually are quite a lot of places where you can optimize. So yeah. uh, how, d how does it actually behave? Uh, I I are the open source tools quite good or mm -hmm. there is really really a big gap between them and the commercial products. I understand. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Well, the uh, thing is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the problem with whole FPGA technology is that uh, technology is closed. So basically, the, uh, you can't find any document which explains how FPGAs are actually organized inside. I mean, you have this um, image that I showed at the beginning. Th that's, th that's the uh, far as they go. Actually, they, they say, okay, we have these building blocks and that's it. Uh, how they are connected, uh, what can you actually use to optimize, they don't tell you that. And uh, these open source tools are actually product of about uh, two or three years, uh, something like more like three years of work of, of just a few guys uh, that basically reverse engineered whole um, internal structure of that F uh, this concrete FPGA. So they make it possible to make a tool that will uh, create the code for it. Uh, but it doesn't have those op optimization, additional optimization, uh, because, uh, I mean, even th 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 these are simple, so you can't do much. I mean, they, they optimize a, a lot of things, but, you know, there is still a room. Uh, but a uh, good thing is that, for example, you can use Yosis uh, to create... Um, output, you know, for uh, even for the Xilinx chips, for example, or Altira. And then uh, you can use place and route that are originally from Altira and from Xilinx to, to, uh, to optimize it for uh, their hardware. So you can mix uh, tools together. But I think I it's going in the right direction. So sooner or later, you know, we will get more and more better tools. Uh, but it's a kind of same situation like we had on, for example, for C++. There was a time when you just have a commercial compilers and nothing was there else, you know, and when GCC start going, uh, it became better and better. And then we get better other tools as well because they saw it as, as, 
as you know uh, it was good to compete with them you know they they start getting the the features before uh, Microsoft and the others and then uh, it's good you know to compete between so so basically yeah that there is a room for improvement uh, but we are we are still something somewhere like in 90s for compilers <laughs> something like that for the FPGA okay thank you thank you So, any other questions? Okay, I don't see any hands, so thank you. Thank yeah. you, Modric. I think we have something for you, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, if, if anyone wants to ask any question, you can find me here on the conference. I will be here both days, so... <laughs> Take full advantage of that. Just yeah. see you see him it take drinking coffee. Don't let him drink coffee, but ask questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> grab him on the lunch. You know, <laughs> take every opportunity. He's here for two days. Exactly.